Beth, how are you? Thank you so much for taking the time to to chat today. As I mentioned when we first met uh, here virtually, it, it's funny to say that always because it's like, oh, I feel like I know you um, even though we've never met in person. And um, I just really appreciate you and your, your, you know, kind of like straight shooter and just uh, kind of a really great person to communicate with. Um, and, and I've sort of distilled that down uh, here over a short period of time. But anyways, thank you so much for your uh, for your time today. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Well, why don't you take a, a quick second to kind of just tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your current role at Animoto. I've you know, as I mentioned when we first connected, you know, I've been a, a fan of what you were uh, building for such a long time, just given that I was in the video space in the past and uh, was quite familiar with the tool. Yeah, so um, I'm the VP of Marketing at Animoto, and Animoto is a, an easy online uh, video creation platform that makes it easy for anyone, no matter what their skill level is, uh, to create video. Um, I've been at Animoto now for about about eight years. And prior to that, I was primarily an entrepreneur, had several businesses throughout the year. Awesome. And congratulations on the recent acquisition. That's, uh, you know, really awesome. And, and what we all strive for, uh, for the most part, right in our space. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Cool. Well, why don't we dive into kind of, you know, what we've been going through, uh, I would say, you know, over the, the last, you know, two years or so, right? Uh, it's a- almost at this point in SaaS. You know, what is top of mind during these challenging uh, periods for a VP of marketing? And what are you thinking about, you know, going into 2024? Uh, and, you know, how do you sort of uh, approach navigating through this uncertainty? Yeah, it's really funny that you ask um, because just earlier this week I was I was part of a customer advisory board for a product that we use. Blue Shift is our email platform. Mm-hmm. I'll shout out for them. Um, but there were 25 other marketing leaders um, in the room, and of course this was like the top question, right? And it was interesting because, you know, I like oh wow everybody's. <laughs> Everybody's talking about the same thing. They're all thinking about the same things that I am. Oh, that makes me actually feel somewhat relieved. Yeah, right. uh, they're dealing with the same issues, you know, all the things are, you know, what they're focused on. Like, I think everything that that came up and bubbled up in the theme was something that definitely has been a lot on my mind and, and, and where, you know, we're, we're talking about focusing a lot of our energy in 2024. I mean, obviously, everybody in the space is talking about AI, like that's sort of like a given. And it was funny because even in that, we it was just sort of like glossed over really quick, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how's this going to impact our business? How are we going to, how can we leverage it to improve our products or, you know, our own workflows, output, what are we doing? So, you know, at a surface level, you know, I think everybody's talking about AI. Um, But to be honest with you, the, the biggest thing and what I, you know, I hear and I hear this from my own customers and I hear this from other marketing leaders, not just in this group and other things is, you know, it's just how do we do more with less? Almost every marketing leader I know, um, you know, they've their budgets have been cut. Their staff has been cut over the last year. They're not hiring. They're they're not they're not able to sort of grow their budget, you know, so really there was a lot of discussion around, you know, acquisition and how to grow a business when there's such cutbacks and restraints and conservatism, right. That nobody's ready to come out of. And so that was, you know, a big sort of the do more with less, how are we going to figure out to do that? Um, You know, and it's just like, it's made it hard. It's hard for acquisition. This is, this is where I, this is what I lose sleep over at night. I'm not going to lie to you. It's like, okay, how am I going to take these dollars and how am I going to make it the most efficient and where do I place my bets? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think too, like when you're asking like how to, to navigate that uncertainty, I mean, for me, I manage it by having a really rigorous system of prioritization, right? It's like, where where am I spending my time? Where's my team spending their time? Where are those dollars going? You know, making an informed decision using data as much as possible uh, to really make my bets, you know, to put them at my advantage, right? Because I need to make uh, good decisions 
uh, with a limited budget and, and how am I going to make those bets and, and really where am I going to prioritize our time and efforts? Mm. It's like, it's what I call it is ruthless prioritization. Mm -hmm. And I have been in that mindset and mode for about three years since actually the pandemic started. And, and I think that's probably the best way to, to, to manage something like that, the do more with less mentality. Do you think that this do more with less is going to stick? Is this just going to be kind of like the protocol moving forward in our industry? You know, you look at organizations like um, Instagram, for example. I remember Instagram uh, during the early days pre pre you know acquisition. They were like a twelve person team, right? And it's a little different because they're B they're B two C, right? But like they did a lot with very little. And there's been some other, you know, sort of uh, use cases like that or, or case studies, I should say, of organizations who have been able to do that. So, yeah, again, do you think that's going to be kind of the, the protocol moving forward? Or are we going to get back to a place where we'll take a little more risks, we'll, we'll build out some, you know, organizations and try a couple of things that maybe are not the most capital efficient? First of all, I hope not. <laughs> Let's just say that. I hope this is not here to stay forever. I think, to be honest with you, and it goes to a little bit what we were even talking about before the recording about you know uh, startups and and you know uh, funding and things like that. You know, there was this sort of time where there were just open purse strings and people were just spending like crazy and spending ahead. And I think you know we've seen a lot of that over the past few years. You know, sort of fail. Um, and so, you know, now we're in this real sort of recession period where it's like, oh, we're really going to tighten up and pull back the purse strings. I think we have to find some sort of medium ground because, you know, that's what I keep saying. Like, I can't grow without money. Like, I, mm -hmm. it's not possible um, to really do without some investment in, into that growth. But I think, again, it's finding the right balance in, in sort of, you know, checks and balances, because I think in a lot of times you saw these things where there were no checks and that, you know, the, mm. <laughs> like whatever, it was just like spend and, and then cut, cuddling somebody spins themselves into, oh, well, we're going bankrupt. And it's like, yeah. oh, you know, you're just continually losing money. It's so I think, you know, that, you know, it feels like, you know, you, you've seen the economy go through those things too, like the ups and downs. It's like, it's a push and pull system. And I think we've got to get something that's a little bit sort of give and take, hopefully. Mm that's where we we get to but we'll see hmm. well let's dive into you know video um you know it's i know it's uh near and dear to your heart just given what you do and, and certainly for me you know why is video so important uh from your perspective and in what ways should go to market organizations leverage video yeah i mean honestly and I don't necessarily say so. First of all, Animoto, I was an Animoto customer long before I started to work at Animoto. That's actually how my relationship was born with Animoto. So for me, video, I mean, I was a photographer for 20 years um, and I was also, uh, you know, a storyteller. So, you know, going from that medium, I used video even when I was a still photographer because I knew the power of video. It's part of storytelling, right? Um, so for me, you know, video is really one of the best ways to really connect and engage with your audience and to be able to tell a more, you know, a, a, a richer story and to find connection with your audience and engagement. So to me, like it is super important um, in, in those ways. And again, as go to mark as people that are that are product marketers or people that are concerned about go to market, it's all about telling a story, right? And we know that video is a powerful meaning in telling any story. So number one, that's, that's, you know, nothing to be stated there. Um, you know, I just read a stat on HubSpot in a, in a market survey for 2023 that states that about 87% of marketers report that, that video had some sort of direct impact on their sales. I mean, those numbers don't lie. Video is here to say it's what connects with the customers. They continue to want more video and, you know, and we're delivering, you know, we're leveraging it more and more. So I think, you know, it's so important in today's environment and our customers demand it, to be honest with you. Yeah. A um, couple of the ways, you know, I think the best way for me to go about is like, how can they leverage it is going back to like how, you know, I talk to a lot of our users. I love talking to our users, by the way. 
Uh, it's always so insightful. But the ways in which, you know, we're doing, I'm, you know, we're obviously doing this, but where our customers, they're telling us the same thing is, you know, it's important to sort of show, don't tell, like I can tell, but when you see something in real life and video, you know, like th with AI coming and with just a, a static image, you know, sometimes that's not the whole story. And you're like, oh, I want to see this three dimensional understanding of maybe what your product is or who you are in that way. So, you know, show don't tell is is always a thing. And video is a, a great medium for that. I think you can build a lot of trust with your customers through video. You can humanize your brand, um, you know, explain your product or service. These are all the ways that our customers are using it and the way that we're using um, it as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, I hear a lot these it's interesting post pandemic, how much more I hear our customers talking about, you know, I don't want to be on camera, but I need to be on camera because I need to humanize my brand. Mm -hmm. And and when I'm on camera, that's when people respond and engage with me. And we're seeing that, too, in our own, in our own data. Uh, we're seeing the same thing. But but it's interesting in this post pandemic world of, of a lot more people turning to digital medium to actually buy, but also still craving that human connection. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think video to your point really provides like a, a way for us in this distributed world, internet based world to still connect with another human being in a very visual way. Yeah. Um, not to get into spiritual talk, but I, I think uh, I, I, I definitely miss uh, in person and there is an energy, right. That you feel when you're in person. And I think the closest thing to that is, is definitely video. It just makes total sense. I think another reason why video is important. And this is something that I, you know, it just sort of came to me. It's something that I do practice and think about, especially in work and making sure not only I connect with, my team um, and or, you know, when I'm working on collaborative pro projects across the org, but also just connecting with the customer is everybody has a different learning style. And a lot of times like written word, things like that, they it, it's it's not their uh, a person's learning style. And so mixing these sort of mixed media that video can do with text and motion and, and imagery is one of the ways to like, you know, it, bring in all the senses and all the different types of learning style and reach people on a much deeper level and really make like your brand or your statements stickier. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you see that, you know, I talk to people about like, Oh, if you're going to give a presentation, don't just, just don't just have a wall of text. No, people are just going to tune that out. Right. You want to have some sort of imagery with it to like reinforce that. If you can have video to reinforce that, that's why I think also is just about how people consume and retain information. Video is a huge important component of that, that, that I don't want to leave off the table. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Sure. Well, you know, you talked about kind of the pandemic and, and some of the, you know, impact that, that, uh, that has had right uh, on the way we do business, but you know, if you were to think about this whole consumerization of B2B and how it's impacted, um, you know, B2, like B2B marketing organizations, um, how, how do you think that's impacted, like, the use of video in our motions? Yeah. I mean, definitely during the pandemic, a lot of B2B sellers, you know, they had to find new ways to reach and connect their buyers. Um, and video had to become a big part of that process because a lot of times, that sales was in person or at a trade show or, you know, th you know, in, in a room together oftentimes. So, you know, I've talked to a lot of sales leaders who are like, Oh my God, we had to really completely rethink. And we started making these videos and distributing them in these ways. So it really changed sort of how they had to, to sell their products. Right. Um, and it's interesting because you can talk about the consumerization, like, you know, we have a lot of crossover between consumer and business. And, and, you know, so the interesting thing is, is there's a lot of similarities in the way they buy, consume information. And, and for a long time, I think B2B really didn't think about, you know, some of that crossover in, in how to think about the, what they were getting. Like for me as a person, let's just say, you know, I go online and I buy a shirt and I have a certain experience um, it's personalized in so many ways and I get to the, and, and when it's not, I get frustrated and mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm out. 
this is terrible UX, right? I don't know. Um, but when I go to, you know, a lot of times when you go to a sort of a B2B, I want that same experience. I, my expectations are already there on how I, you know, what do you mean you don't know who I am? Or what do you mean this, I can't just go and find this information out on my own. I don't necessarily want to talk to somebody if you want to yeah. know the truth all the time. I'm on a fact finding mission and I'll, when I'm ready to talk, I'll be ready to talk. Um, so I think again, you know, buyers were already used to, to engaging with consumer brands in that way across these digital experiences. Um, and when we had to shift that way in the pandemic, it just kind of, you know, it just sort of, they started to demand that like, okay, well at work, I want it to be very similar to this. If I'm buying a piece of software, I, I want the same type of experience. And so what video did during this time is, you know, it just really brought in new ways to connect and engage their audiences that they really hadn't maybe thought of before. And I think too, a lot of people that I talk to are like, wow, I can actually, it's, it's increased my sales because I can actually reach more people. Some of this information can be self-serve. It doesn't necessarily always take that much of my time. So they've also figured out how, you know, like if they spend, X number of hours on a sale that's a $10,000 sale, they've also figured out, well, they can get a $1,000 sale with very little touch point with the consumer and the ROI on that's actually really great because they can serve them digital information, including video, and the deal is is closed, right? Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, that, that product-led sort of uh, movement that's been going on a couple for a couple of years now, even though product led growth has been around for, you know, ages, you know, all these things come to mind as, as you were speaking to this. Well, you know, I know that attribution is a big, <laughs> big question, right? It's specifically with video and there's a lot of solutions that have been tackling this, you know, from your perspective, how can marketers track attribution when using video across the funnel? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Part of that group that I was talking about, that advisory board, there was a lot of talk about attribution and how it's getting, you know, with privacy issues, it's becoming more difficult. Um, it's already difficult, you know, across the funnel. I mean, how how attribution is done inside Google, Facebook, Meta, and these other areas is it's a black box, right? For for a large degree, um, so it's tough. Attribution's always tough. It's hard. Um, I think, and video is is somewhat hard too, right? Like I. I talk to a lot of customers and users who are like, they all do it in different ways and how it's meaningful for them. I would say probably the most common thing that I hear across the board is really views and watch mm -hmm. time, right? Is like how many people laid eyes on that piece of content. But I think sometimes even more important is the watch time and how engaged they were with that. Because if they're watching longer, that means they they're, the content that you're giving them is resonating with them and it's working. Um, but you know, it's kind of like a funnel, right? It's kind of like any type of funnel. It's like you got to get eyes on it to actually get to the engagement. Mm -hmm. But I think these are probably the two biggest metrics that when you're really talking about video, because it's hard to get attribution to like, oh, did that person watch this video somewhere in their journey? Did they see it? You know, did that really affect the sale? Because there were three other touch points after that that maybe or did not include video. It's really tough. So I think really just kind of going back to that piece of content itself and how many eyes were on it and how long did people watch it is probably your best measure right now to really understand if it's doing its job. Yeah, and I would argue that just even if you don't have a clear sort of uh, view of the impact uh, or attribution um, around video, I mean, it, <laughs> video is just such a much more pleasurable, dynamic experience, right? Like, why would you not? I mean, you know, think about radio versus TV. TV took off in the way it did for a reason, right? And the only reason why I think we uh, we don't have TVs in uh, in our cars uh, completely is because self-driving hasn't taken off. But, you know, once we do, right, <laughs> and we don't have to watch the road, why would you not have a video screen in front of you, right? So... Um, so that makes total sense. You know, in terms of like emerging trends that you see in SaaS marketing, you know, anything that, uh, you know, that you're, you're seeing that really stands out. And then, you know, the second piece to my question is like, how are you adapting to stay ahead of the curve? You know, especially when things are moving so quickly. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know specifically in SaaS marketing, but I think for for what we're seeing and what we've built into the product is the pandemic changed a lot for video about um, what people, the demand for video and the demand for video creation, right? So we saw this huge rise. You know, we had really thought about videos only as external people marketing to their marketing audiences. Um, but one big trend that's not necessarily, I wouldn't say a marketing trend, but there's internal marketing, mm -hmm. right? So we saw this rise of what we call internal video creation that rose during the pandemic and the demand for it. And now, you know, it, it, it's really on a lot of people's minds. Um, so that was one thing that really sort of, again, the pandemic really changed. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, collaborative workflows and processes, you see a lot of tools now because of the pandemic moving in the direction of like, you know, you see the the looms, the world, the Miro, uh, Fig Jam, these other, you know, ways that Adobe, you know, is getting into that to in that game too, is like these collaborative, there's demand for collaborative workflows and processes. Um, and I think that's just, again, more companies are dispersed, they're hybrid or completely remote. Um, so for us, we, we heard a lot about this demand for collaborative video creation. Um, and so it was interesting because in my early years at Animoto, most people were like, yeah, I don't want anybody else involved in making this video. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. I don't want anybody to be involved. But because things have changed now and we're hearing people like, yeah, I want to do this. I want to hand it off to somebody else and then do this other part. And I want to be we want to collaborate together. It's very different. The mindset. Um, and so it opens up a whole new world, I think. Um, so we really we recently released a new product that was designed for teams to work mm -hmm. collaboratively, collaboratively on video creation together. And so part of that is too is like you know we have a tool within that within that plan um, that has commenting. So you know generally you know you've got to get stakeholders involved and people have to sign off on video. And this is always sort of an ardu arduous process of sending it through Slack or sending it through emails. And there's these long email chains and threads. You know, now you can just send it to someone and just the way in a Google Doc, they can go in at, at any time standpoint and say like, hey, there's a typo here. Let's change this asset out. Um, and so you can have a whole thread on that makes that a lot easier. And again, they can share they can share the assets, they can share the videos, create templates and brands that more people can share. So it empowers more people to create video. Mm. And this has been, you know, where we've really adapted uh, to meet the demands of these sort of new ways that people want to, to, to work um, and collaborate together. Awesome. Well, last question that I had, and again, thank you so much for your time. If you were to think about, kind of a recent marketing innovation or campaign that you found particularly effective? Anything that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I think going back to what I had said earlier, this is, uh, uh, we, we started a campaign recently where we basically really, we've always used video, like, you know, obviously <laughs> we have to walk the walk, right? Um, but we did a, a, a test where we really, really wanted to focus on every video had a face, had someone from our company humanizing our brand, talking to them person to person. Um, and we wanted to sort of test that out against our other methods to see, you know, if that made a difference, you know, in theory, we believe that it would. And, and actually it did. It did. Um, so we started making sure that every video that we would would uh, post had had someone's face and we're talking directly to the customer, even if we're showing something on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, so you, we can do a web recording and, and a, a screen and web recording and have our head there at least some point. Um, and we've seen a 25% increase in our engagement when someone is face is featured on that in that video talking to the audience. Um, so it's not really an innovation per se. And I don't even know that it's actually an People are seeing this. It's very trendy in consumer marketing and, and things like that. But we've been seeing a big success same way in, in our B2B and SaaS marketing. Um, so it just it just shows that people do crave that human connection, that mm -hmm. human interaction. And that's going to deepen their their relationship with you. Awesome. Beth, thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciated. If, if folks wanted to connect with you on social media, um, what would be the best handles or channels to reach you? Um, 
um, I'm on Instagram, on LinkedIn at Beth Forrester and at Forrester one R F O R E S T E R. Um, and yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And yeah, have a, a great holiday season. Talk soon. Thanks for having me. You too.